Welcome to the Istanbul University Oncology Institute Seminars in Preventive Oncology. The seminars are uh, endorsed by the International Society of Pediatric Oncology, SIO. This is the 32nd seminar of the series, which we have started in December 2020. Today, we have a very distinguished guest. Uh, as most of you know, I'm Regine Keboudi, Professor of Pediatric Hematology Oncology at Istanbul University and the current Secretary General of SIOP, our uh, International Society of Pediatric Oncology. As I say, we have a very distinguished guest today, a legend in neuro-oncology, in pediatric neuro-oncology, Dr. Eric Buffet. Welcome, Dr. Buffet. Before I introduce him, let me show my slides. I will share my slides. So uh, today uh, we will hear from him targeted therapies for pediatric low-grade gliomas. As you know, the survival in pediatric oncology has increased dramatically in neuro-oncology also, and precision oncology nowadays is increasingly uh, evolving and also in pediatric uh, brain tumors in low-grade gliomas. We do have uh, precision oncology targeted therapies, which we'll hear more from Eric Buffet. But before uh, we begin our seminar, I would like to introduce Eric Buffet, and also I would like to congratulate him on the name of all of us, all the pediatric oncologists, uh, for receiving his, Eric Buffet has received a Lifetime Achievement Award in Philadelphia at the International Society of Pediatric Neuro-Oncology 2024 last month. And uh, for the pre this prestigious award is given for his substantial contributions to pediatric oncology and scientific achievements. So we congratulate Dr. Eric Buffet. A hearty congratulations from all of us. All of you know he doesn't need inter introduction. All of us know Eric Buffet, but I would like to give still a short introduction for him. He is an emeritus professor of pediatrics. Uh, in the University of Toronto, six kids' children. He was the past SIO president in the term of 216 and 290, 219, and he is currently the board member of the UICC, the Union Internationale Contre le Cancer, uh, the Union International for uh, uh, Against Cancer. He, ha he, is, uh, he has a lot of achievements. As I say, if I begin to read his achievements, we will not have time for his seminar, but he has helped a lot uh, within the whole world in advancing pediatric neuro-oncology. He is a board member and editor in the editorial board member of many, many prestigious uh, journals in neuro-oncology, in pediatric oncology. He has a lot of achievements uh, that he has gained within these years. But especially, we know that he helps a lot to in low middle income countries to advance neuro oncology in those uh, countries. And for that, we are really thankful to him uh, for all that he has done for pediatric oncology and pediatric neuro oncology in the world. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Eric Buffet to, for his speech on targeted therapies for pediatric low-grade gliomas. We will take the questions, answers, and comments in the at the end, so please write them in the chat so that we can do this, those, we can discuss those at the end. Dr. Buffet, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Regine. Professor Kebudi, that you are Regine from, so we know each other from since a long time, and I'm really delighted and Honor to be here today with you. Um, I, 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 I'm talking from Toronto today. I will be around the world in the next few weeks uh, in Australia, in Pakistan, and in Thailand. And I know that I will meet a number of uh, you uh, during my trip. And I really cherish still uh, my collaboration with uh, everyone around the world. So today I want to share my uh, knowledge about targeted therapy for pediatric low-grade glioma. But knowing, so that's my disclosure. And 
My disclosure are very strongly related to the work I do in pediatric lymphoedema, but also to the advocacy that I have regarding the development of targeted treatment in low and middle income countries. And part of my talk will be a comment about what we can do and what's going to happen in low and middle income countries. But I, I'm fully aware that some of you may not be really comfortable or may not have a full understanding of what pediatric neuroglioma. So I wanted to share some information with you. And just to say, if you talk about pediatric brain tumor, you see that glioma account for half of the brain tumor in children. And most of these glioma in children are low glioma. So if you want to treat the child with brain tumor, if you want to have some knowledge, you need to know a lot about this low glioma because they account for the majority or a large portion of the pediatric brain tumor. And they are highly curable. And that's very important. There are two predisposition conditions. One is neurofibromatosis type one, which gives optic nerve tumor, but also brainstem tumors. And tuberous sclerosis, which gives this type of tumor I'm not going to talk about. It's called, it's called SIGA or subependent astrocytoma. And it has a very, very specific sensitivity to the mTOR inhibitors. So that's a different topic, and I'm not going to talk about this, but I'm happy to come back one day to talk about this. So what is important with pediatric neuroglioma is up to 20 or 30 years ago, essentially the classification was based on microscope and on morphology, and there was no molecular study. It was only CHI-67 and the proliferation index. And there was no clear correlation between pathology and the behavior. Now, when we look at the WHO-21 classification, we can show that things have changed fundamentally because of the introduction of molecular biology and all the genomic study that have discovered numerous entities in pediatric neuroglioma. And this makes the story more complicated, but also more worrisome when you don't have the tool to identify these specific uh, tumors. Uh, sorry, also, Dr. Buffet, uh, could, yeah. you, could you talk closer to the microphone? I think the, wo the voice yeah, would be better. Yeah. I think this is better, yeah. yes. Yeah, I will. So the, the other uh, issue with pediatric glioma, when we want to talk about them, is their location. And the complexity is related to the fact that glioma can arise everywhere in the brain as illustrated on this slide, they can be in the brain, in the spine, and in any part of the brain. And it makes a what we call surgical or non-surgical, depending on their location. Another issue with pediatric logaritioma is their behavior. And some remain very indolent, and particularly in your fibromatosis type 1. And some are much more aggressive, and in particular, the one that we see in young children. They can even disseminate, but with some exception, we do not see malignant transformation of pediatric logarithm. So, and that's the slide to summarize how, how complex is the management of this uh, tumor. It's very stressful because you have a contract with the child and the family just to cure the child or to uh, prevent the tumor to cause any damage, but also to prevent the treatment to cause any damage. And that's where, you know, you have some easy treatment, but they may cause considerable damage. And all the difficulty is in the art of oncology here. So I mentioned surgery. Surgery is curative in the surgical lesion. And uh, the classical example is the cerebellar astrocytoma. So that's the cerebellar astrocytoma that is cured by the surgeon. And you will never see this patient in your clinic because it's just only surgery. But in some critical areas, it's much more complex. 
and the tumor cannot be really removed completely. And of course, there are some more aggressive surgeon and there are some less aggressive surgeon, but at the end, resection, complete resection is exceptional or very, very unlikely in this location. So in this context, when you see that this tumor is progressing and likely to cause neurological damage, the question is what treatment you did. And up to recently, this was a discussion about radiation and chemotherapy. And there are some people who are more in favor of uh, chemotherapy, some more in favor of radiation, but we have data now that show that, you know, when, when you give radiation, it's likely to be more effective, but at a cost which is significant, not in the short term, but in the long term, with your risk of stroke, a risk of secondary tumor, a risk of endocrine deficit, and some risk of decline in cognition, particularly in younger children. And there are data that suggest that, uh, that, you know, when you give radiation, you can have some late event. It was first observed or identified in a work done by the group in Boston when they looked at the SEER data, when they showed that patients who received radiation for low radioma had a lower survival in the long term. And this was also confirmed by Raul Krishnati when he was in Toronto. He wrote this uh, very, very nice paper on the long term outcome of patients with low radioma, showing that you have a late event, both in thalamic and brainstem tumor, particularly in patients who were treated initially with radiation therapy. And so when we look at the modern technique of radiation and particularly proton, because people say, yes, but with proton, we have less side effects. You still will irradiate the large vessel. You still have a risk of stroke. So things are not going to change even if you have the best technique of radiation. So what about chemotherapy? Chemotherapy was initially given in the context of uh, uh, a recurrent tumor after failure of radiation. And then when people discovered that chemotherapy had some activity in pediatric blood radioma, chemotherapy was an offer up front, particularly in the military field, both in the silent protocol and in the North American protocol. And as you can see on this slide, chemotherapy works and sometimes works repeatedly. This slide was treated at the end of the field. Uh, Dr. Buffet, can you speak closer to the microphone? I think there's a problem with the vo vo with voice. Uh, so that, yeah, yeah. now I, it's perfect. I, I now it's perfect, yes. We don't okay. want our participants to miss any of this information. That's why, thank you. <laughs> okay, so let me know if it's not uh, loud enough. If so, and... You you, you see on this slide, so this patient was two years and a half when she was treated for this large cervical medullary tumor. She's now 35 years old. She's a mom, and she never received any other treatment than chemotherapy. And of course, what is difficult is to know exactly when you need to treat and what are the criteria to treat. And that's still a topic of uh, extensive debate. There are COG guidelines, there are SIOP guidelines. Oh, by the way, I will share my slide with anyone who wants these slides so you can read them uh, uh, more quietly. So, but I will uh, skip these guidelines because they are a bit complex and I want to go relatively quickly to target the treatment. But the main question is what is the aim of the treatment? And the aim of the treatment in pediatric glioglioma is multiple. Of course, you want the patient to survive, but you want the patient to survive with a good functional outcome. And particularly, the example is the visual preservation in the context of optic pathoglioma. So it makes low glioma a chronic disease. So that's not a disease that you are going to fix in one shot. And when you give chemotherapy, it illustrates this comment. When you give chemotherapy, you will have 
the tumor control, but the tumor control is going to decrease over time. And you can see that there is a plateau at around 40% at five years in all the clinical trials that have been conducted, regardless of the uh, protocol or the combination. And so it means that when you treat a patient with low grade glioma, you have to choose a protocol. And the question is, is there a protocol that is better than another? There, there were a few randomized studies, in fact, three randomized studies in low grade glioma. So this is one that compared TPCV with vancristine carbo. And TPCV was a winner. So this is a protocol 9952. But despite the fact that TPCV was slightly better, nobody wanted to change the order of the treatment because vancristine carbo is much less toxic than TPCV. And in the context of the chronic disease, this is also an important component. So having said that, when you look at this event-free survival and overall survival, you can say that overall survival is good. Event-free survival is not good. It's around 40%. And it means that when you treat patients with low-grade glioma, you most of the time will have to give more than one line of treatment, chemotherapy and chemotherapy again, or chemotherapy and then radiation, but you will have to treat on several occasions. And in this context, it's important that you anticipate the cumulative toxicity, which is summarized here. Carboplatin gives allergic reaction, and that's a big trouble. TPCV has much more worrisome toxicity. Etoposide and cisplatin has a risk of hearing loss, and hearing loss is devastating in a child who has visual compromise. Remember this. Temozolomide has a poor activity and has a risk of second cancer. This is an alkylating agent. Vamblastin and vinorabin have no long-term toxicity that is known to date. And bevacizumab, which is a good drug, can cause some trouble in the long term. So what's important to know is when you give a second or a third or a fourth line of chemotherapy, you have the same result. You still have the 40% plateau at five years. So it means that when you treat a patient for the second time or the third time, it's not a lost battle. And we have patients who have required two or three or four lines of treatment, and then the tumor settled. And this is what we see in pediatric low glioma. Many tumors, they stop growing around the age of the puberty. And now let's go to the big topic, which is you know, the target treatment and why did we go into this targeted uh, treatment era? So the beginning of the story was in 2008 when at the same time in Germany and in the UK there were two publications that identified this alteration on chemical 7 that is called today the VRAF treatment. And with this, there was a lot of excitement because it was identified that this alteration was targeted. And Sorry, Dr. Buffet, your voice, uh, we need a lot. Yeah, you have to have. Yeah, now I think it will be better if you come closer. Yes. I can change the yes. computer yes. if you wish. No, it's good. But... It's good. It's good. Okay. So the, um, the alteration that were identified in pediatric logridioma increased over time and this uh, seminal paper was published in 2020 by uh, Uri Tabori and Cynthia Hawking, looking at 1,000 pediatric low grade glioma. And you can see that there are three main alterations. One is this BRA fusion, called also Chi II 1549 BRA fusion. The second uh, one is the BRA mutation. And these are seen in non-NF1 patients. And also common is the NF1 mutation that is seen exclusively in patients with neurofibromatosis type 1. But you can see then there is a cascade of over alteration, including BRAF, Keras, and also other uh, uh, MAP uh, kinase uh, pathway. 
FGFR, which is also uh, an alteration that is seen in a number of pediatric glioma, and all this alteration that we see mostly in uh, young children and babies are cross and track in low grade, but also in high grade tumor. But you could also see that, in fact, some patients who have some low grade histology can have or can hide a very, very worrisome mutation such as the H33 K27M, that's a very small proportion, or IDH1 mutation, which is more in keeping with the adult type glioma. But what is important is many of these alterations that have been described are targetable. So it means that if you have the identity card of the low grade glioma, you may be able to use a treatment that is going to selectively target the alteration and not to use a chemotherapy agent which has no clear identification of the target. So, and as I mentioned, in the babies, you have these uh, alterations that are uh, relatively uh, uncommon in older age, but you can see sometimes particularly ALK in pediatric low-grade glioma. So that's a low-grade glioma here. You can see that a number of little ones can have ALK alteration. So the question is, so how do you uh, identify this target and how do you uh, work out when you have a patient who has a, a low-grade glioma you want to see? and there is the issue of the technique, and with immunohistochemistry, you can only identify a limited number of alterations, and in particular, BRAF mutation. You cannot identify BRAF fusion, and there are a number of alterations that are difficult to identify. And more and more, there are techniques that are favor for the identification of this alteration, and in particular, RNA sequencing, which requires fresh frozen tissue. So you can imagine that we are not anymore in the WHO classification. We are more in the G20 classification, where only a small number of institutions in high-income country can access these techniques. So there is some hope that in the future, we will be able to identify this alteration not by doing a biopsy, but by taking CSF. And this is a paper that was published two years ago by Dr. Karajanis from Memorial Sloan, Sloan Kettering that used uh, CSF to uh, uh, identify or to analyze the ctDNA, the cell-free DNA, and you can see, for example, that he was able to identify alteration in four diffuse leptinangial glioneural tumor, also called DLGNT. But in low-grade glioma, the little one or the regular one or the localized, he was not very successful. But we can hope that in the future, we'll be able to identify this alteration not by doing a biopsy, but only by doing CSF study, and the technique is improving day by day. So what is important is with this alteration, there are a number of drugs that have not been developed for pediatric neuro-oncology specifically, but they have activity and sometimes spectacular activity. And I will show you an example. So this is a child with a BRAF mutation treated with dabrafenib. And you can see on the top that the contrast enhancement disappeared very quickly. At the bottom, that the flare uh, abnormality disappeared more slowly. But eventually, the patient had a very, very good response to treatment. And this child is even more spectacular, had a BRAF fusion. And a uh, diencephalic syndrome failed multiple lines of chemotherapy, this enormous tumor that shrunk very, very significantly over a period of 18 months of time. And there have been studies that have been conducted that have confirmed the efficacy of this uh, uh, MEC or BRAF inhibitor 
in the context of pediatric logoridioma. So that's one of the early publications from the PBTC using selumetinib, which is a MEK inhibitor. And uh, selumetinib was used in any logoridioma. Patients with BRAF uh, fusion, patients with BRAF mutation, and patients with neurofibromatosis type 1. On the left are patients with BRAF alteration, the blue are the fusion, the red are the mutation. And you can see that you have spectacular response, even if we don't understand why some patients who still have the alteration do not respond to this type of drug. In the NF1 population, also spectacular response, but not uniform. And this is really something which is raising question. Why do we have heterogeneity of response and we still don't have a clear ID? This may be related to other factors such as the micro environment around the tumor cells. The big question is, are these drugs better than chemotherapy? And the first work that uh, and was conducted to compare was a retrospective comparison of the result of BRAF inhibitor in BRAF V600 uh, uh, mutated uh, logradioma versus chemotherapy. And this was done by Liana Nobre, who is here on this picture. And when you look at the waterfall plot, you can see that there is clearly evidence that the BRAF inhibitors, the target treatment, are better than chemotherapy. What Liana did after, she looked at the uh, long-term outcome of the patient and she said, this is a bit disappointing because in the long term, I see that the progression-free survival uh, curve looks pretty much the same as the one that we see in patients with, uh, treated with chemotherapy. But going further, she looked at patients who stay on the medication and she showed that 80% were still under control after five years. Whereas the patient who discontinued the BRAF inhibitor had for most of them, 75% had a rapid progression over a period of six months. So suggesting that one issue here is the discontinuation of the drug, and I will come back to this. But really, the best way to answer the question of whether one is better than another was a randomized study, and this was conducted under the uh, uh, sponsorship of Novartis, the uh, pharmaceutical company. And this was an upfront study for patients who were treatment naive with a BRAF a mutated, BRAF V600 mutated positive low radioma, and who were randomized uh, for targeted treatment versus chemotherapy. This was dabrafenib, trametinib, versus carboplatin and vancristine in a two to one ratio. So this study was uh, concluded and uh, uh, recruited over 110 patients. And you can see that in terms of response rates, the overall response rate using very stringent criteria was uh, really in favor of the targeted treatment, 47% versus 11%. And the clinical benefit rate was also uh, much superior with a 40% difference between the targeted treatment and the chemotherapy. And this was across all histology uh, where the targeted treatment was much superior than the response observed in, uh, with chemotherapy. And the sustainability of the response was also very interesting. The green as a sustained response, and you can see there is much more green in the DAPTRAM than in the chemotherapy arm. And this tr translated into a much uh, obvious benefit in terms of progression-free survival that uh, was favoring the targeted treatment. Now, you may say, this is really not very good, 66% versus 26%. 
This is essentially related to the criteria that were used by the central review. I don't want to go into very much detail, but some patients had spectacular response. For example, their tumor was five centimeter, reduced to one centimeter, but then any variation from the nadir, which was one centimeter, uh, was considered as progression. So that's why we had this drop in the progression per survival, which is in fact not what we see in the real life. And this is what we see in the real life, according to the investigator, we're taking the initial tumor measurement, and you can see that still there is a benefit in favor of the, the targeted treatment versus the chemotherapy. What's interesting is when we look at the quality of life that was measured by the global health score, there was a sort of persistence or even improvement in the quality of life in the patient treated with targeted treatment whereas there was some uh, gradual decrease in the quality of life for the patient treated with chemotherapy. The profile of side effect was different between the two um, arms with more skin toxicity and parexia with the targeted treatment and more hematological toxicity and GI toxicity, vomiting and nausea in the uh, chemotherapy arm. All of this was published in the New England uh, Journal of Medicine in September 2023. And this uh, paper is uh, uh, on open access and you can read it or access it very readily. So there is another BRAF inhibitor known uh, called uh, the Murafenib, and you certainly heard about this. Unfortunately, not a lot of data in the pediatric population. There was this PNOC2 study that was conducted and published four years ago that has shown very interesting activity, but no further big publication on this agent. And certainly it's to work on uh, dabrafinib and tramitinib has been much more consistent, leading to the FDA approval of the combination, whereas bemurafenib is not yet approved for pediatric usage. What is important is when you use this uh, medication, it's that you, you need to be aware of the side effect and you need to treat very closely, to work very closely with dermatologists because you have a lot of skin side effect. And I tell you, when I saw this teenager after two weeks of treatment, she was mad at me and she wanted to discontinue the treatment. So we learned that, for example, in teenager, you have really to anticipate acne from reaction and you have to use cream. You, you need to see the patient early on just to make sure that you are in control of the side effect. There are also some side effects that are more complex. So this one was uh, studied and reported by my colleague and friend, Ute Bartes, who identified, uh, you know, severe hyponatremia in children treated with for diabetes insipidus. And in fact, when you have a diabetes insipidus in a child and you use MEK inhibitor, you will have to decrease dramatically the dose of DDAVP because you will see that uh, there is a, a suddenly a decrease in the needs of uh, the DDRVP in this patient. The other issue is a weight gain that is often seen and particularly with MEK inhibitor. And this weight gain is a problem because it can be very significant. Usually it's reversible, but some patients remain overweight at the end of the treatment. So very important to work with the dietitian. And of course, there is a lot of excitement with this uh, uh, drug called tovorafenib, which was called day 101. After there was uh, an initial report in 2020, this is a panraf inhibitor. So it's higher in the MAP kinase pathway. And with this, there is no risk of paradoxical activation. I will show you later what is paradoxical act activation. The beauty of tovorafenib is you have to take it one week and there is an oral administration, which is not the case with selumetinib or um, there is a, a, a liquid formulation, which is not the case with selumetinib or Springer's uh, formulation. 
And this drug has um, been uh, uh, reported in several uh, meetings. The activity has been reported. So that's the early report showing a very good response uh, to this agent. But the criteria that were used were a bit uh, uh, unclear using what we call rhino high grade glioma criteria when we would have uh, better use the rhino low grade glioma criteria. And this is illustrated in this uh, a slide where you see on the top left the rhino HCG criteria and at the bottom the uh, rhino LGG and the, RAN the RAPNO, which are the pediatric criteria that show a much different uh, response rate, but still a spectacular activity of tovorafenib. So as a result of this clinical trial, tovorafenib was approved for the treatment of recurrent uh, low gradioma with PRAF alteration, PRAF fusion or PRAF mutation in April, 2024. And uh, so this was FDA approved and we hope that the approval will also extend to other countries. So a few things that I want to say. There are things that you shouldn't do. Do not use BRAF inhibitor in patients with NF1. Do not use BRAF inhibitor in patients with BRAF fusion. And I will show you what it means. And do not use doporaf inhib in patients with NF1. Why do I say this? There was this clinical trial that was conducted at Memorial Sloan Kettering and NYU of uh, sorafenib, which is a weak BRAF inhibitor. And they treated the patient regardless of the alteration. And they saw that most of the patient had progression of their tumor and really a bad progression of their tumor with sorafenib. And then they worked with Stefan Pister and the team in Heidelberg, and they identified that this patient had either a BRAF fusion or an NF1 mutation and were progressing when they were given a BRAF inhibitor. So this is called paradoxical activation. You make the tumor grow instead of make the tumor shrink. And this has been identified in preclinical work. So the uh, other thing is, uh, and that's uh, N of one uh, evidence, but in the first report on tovorafenib, there was one patient with NF1, and this is a patient here, who had progression on tovorafenib. And there were further work that was done on uh, NF1, on preclinical work on NF1, suggesting that tovorafenib may cause paradoxical activation or may cause progression of NF1. That's why tovorafenib trials are not open for patients with NF1. I mentioned over alteration and there are some uh, uh, over alteration that are important because uh, the tumor are often associated with poor response to chemotherapy. They are difficult to treat. FGFR alteration. Uh, this tumor often they bleed and often do not respond very well to carboplatin and macrocystin and to other chem chemotherapy agents. So there are some FGFR inhibitors, some have been tested. And so this is a report on Debio 1347, which uh, has shown some very interesting activity. You can see in this patient, a dramatic reduction of the cyst, an improvement of the visual field. And this patient with a spinal cord tumor has shown a dramatic reduction in the size of the tumor with uh, this uh, medication. There are other FGFR inhibitors, infigratinib or edafitinib, and so this is a patient treated with infigratinib. You can see this massive holocord spinal cord tumor with a dramatic response to treatment. Unfortunately, FGFR inhibitors are associated with very, very significant bone toxicity. And this was reported by the team who did the debut study with uh, 
the uh, what we call skipped capital femoral epiphysis. All these patients, they were three of the six patients who require surgery for some um, uh, uh, slip capital femoral epiphysis in this study. So very significant toxicity and all the attempt to develop clinical trial with FGFR inhibitor in the pediatric population have been put on hold. We also have to learn with humility, what does it mean here? Learning with humility means, let's look at what happened to the patient and try to integrate. So this patient was in a clinical trial of trametin, and we didn't know the alteration. And she had this beautiful response to trametinib until we discovered that the alteration that she had was an FGFR mutation. So you can have beautiful response to a MEC inhibitor with an FGFR mutation. And this is something that has been observed in several patients treated with MEC inhibitors. Now, this one is a, a an amazing story of a patient who had a BRAF mutation, was treated with famblastin with a modest response, eventually had progression and was put on a clinical trial of dabrafenib. Then trametinib was added and uh, the patient deteriorated, the tumor progressed, the patient became blind, we were just desperate. The treatment was discontinued and the patient had an acute deterioration, acute de clinical deterioration was put back on trametinib and dabrafenib with no effect, was on a high-dose steroid. We, it was uh, more rebound, and we thought that we should give something. Uh, we tried to convince the parents to get radiation. They refused radiation. And we decided to start TPCV, which is chemotherapy. And look at what happened with TPCV. And this patient has been, now is four years later, has been in a state of nearly complete response with chemotherapy only. So we still need to figure out and to learn from our experience and to try to integrate this information in our practice. So at the current time, there are clinical trials going on, which are perhaps seminal to see what is going to be the future of targeted treatment. So this trial is a trial for patients with neurofibromatosis type 1, comparing selimetinib versus carboplatin and vancristin. And uh, the question is going to be which one is the best in terms of response, but also duration of response. This one is in patients with low glioma, non-NF1, not BRAF mutated, and has the same randomization, selimitinib versus carboplatin and vancristin. And the European trial, which is also open in some places in North America, is called LOGIC, is using the PANRAF inhibitor tovorafenib versus a standard of care. It's either vancristin carbo or vanplastin. There are some other uh, uh, agents that are currently in development Miadametinib, which is a brain penetrant metinhibitor, has provided very interesting results in plexiform neurofibroma. There is an FDA submission that is ongoing. It has a twice a day administration, but uh, by contrast with selimetinib, there is no food restriction. Selimetinib, they have to be fasting before, and when you take the drug twice a day, it's very, very bothersome for the kids. So mirdermetinib has this advantage. There are also dispersible tablets, which is not the case for selimetinib. In plexiform, it's three weeks on, one week off. It's continuous in low radioma. And there was a phase one uh, study that was reported by Jail Robinson in, at the ice meeting in 2022. And there is a phase two study going on at St. Jude. Binimetinib is also a very interesting MEC inhibitor with some spectacular results that were reported by Nathan Robinson from CHLA in 2022. 
But it's very, very weird because the development of this drug is relatively slow. We don't see very much publication, so I'm not sure that this is a drug for Pfizer, whether Pfizer is interested or not. But the results are quite compelling when you look at the abstract that I put on the slide. And there is this new drug called Prixorafenib, and that's a very, very exciting drug. It's a sort of panoraf inhibitor because it's target both BRAF mutation and BRAF fusion, no paradoxical activation. And it's combined with this drug called Cobicista, which is increasing the brain penetration with an exposure that is multiplied by two or three. And there was at the, CEO, at the SNOW meeting 2023, some report, and there is a, a trial that is ongoing, which includes children over the age of 10, with the aim of the company, which is called FOR, to uh, develop further, if uh, there is a positive signal, a trial in human children. So the big thing with this is the toxicity profile is absolutely phenomenal, much less side effect compared to the other MEC or BRF inhibitors. Now, as I mentioned, the question is, how do you stop this? And particularly the BRAF inhibitor, because in BRAF mutated tumor, as I showed you from the work from Yana Nobre, 75% of the patient progress within six months. I invite you to read this paper from uh, Greg Ecker and Sebastian Perrault, which is a Canadian consensus suggesting some indications, but the indication for treatment, but also the recommendation for the weaning. And the weaning is to resume or to decrease the, the, the dose of uh, neck or BRAF inhibitor very, very progressively as uh, uh, described here, and not cold turkey uh, as many people do. And with this, you have the possibility to keep the dose or to re-increase the dose with having, without having this paradoxical activation that are often uh, um, rebound, sorry, but are often associated with dramatic clinical deterioration. So you have also some clinical trials that are coming, and uh, in particular, is a combination with ERK inhibitor. So we are going into a much more complex world of people who are just trying to push the drug. And you can see here that you have uh, things that are coming, senolytic drugs, ERK inhibitor with senolytic drug, uh, tovorafeni with senolytic drug, trying to make the tumor to uh, age faster. And this is a dream, is to make sure that we shrink the tumor, but also we make the tumor never grow again. There are still ongoing questions here. And at the end of this talk, so what the EFS comparison, the event-free survival between chemotherapy and targeted treatment? When we look at the selumetinib trial, so this is the NF1 population, this is a BRAF mutated population, and this is a BRAF fused population in the trial reported by Jason Pangusaro. And you can see that it doesn't look very different from the chemotherapy experience. And that's a bit disappointing. This drug have a spectacular activity, but when you stop them, it seems that you have the same history compared to chemotherapy. And we see the same in a recent uh, complete a trial of trametinib in a Canadian group where we see a progressive drop in progression-free survival after discontinuation. And the question is, is there a difference in functional outcome between chemotherapy and BRAF and MEK inhibitor? In the randomized study that was conducted of dabrafenib and trametinib versus chemotherapy, there were more patients with improvement of their vision in the targeted treatment arm, but it was not significant. But that's a very, very interesting signal that we see. And the big question is, what about the time on treatment? And a really, sorry, <clears throat> the time on treatment is very important because it goes with 
how much does it cost and can you get rid or can you discontinue particularly when you have significant side effect. Now, the big issue is when you look at the big picture here and you have the high income country where these drugs are going to be available, but you can see in terms of population and childhood brain tumor, this is really a small proportion compared to the number of brain tumor that you see in low and middle income countries, knowing that half of this tumor would be gliomas. And that the cost, that the cost that you have, look at serimetinib per year, $260,000. Trametinib and dabrafenib doesn't seem to be very, very expensive. That's things that I got from the internet. It's very difficult to find the cost of the drug on the internet or on the website of the company. But basically, you go into thousands of dollars here. And, and the question is really, what can we do to make this drug affordable? And so there was uh, two weeks ago uh, a nature uh, uh, issue looking and with a number of very, very interesting uh, paper and that's one of the papers and that took the example of, for, for example, India has shown how production costs can be reduced, producing $3 lance implant that costs over $100 in high income countries. So we need to work on how to make this drug cheaper, to make them affordable. And this is where it may be interesting to have multiple MEC and BRAF inhibitor because the competition is going to impact on the cost and the costs are going to decrease if there are many drugs. So we shouldn't say it's bad to have too many. It's good to have many because the costs are going to drop. And <clears throat> so, there, there, there was also in the same uh, edition in, in another paper this uh, 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 also comment about uh, closing the gap and access to molecular diagnosis in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, showing that it's important just to figure out how we can identify the alteration and uh, make uh, the offer the possibility to the patient to access targeted treatment. Now, this is happening already. So this was presented two weeks ago at the ISPNO meeting in Philadelphia by uh, Girish uh, Shinaswamy from Tata Memorial Hospital. And this was a very, very exciting uh, presentation showing the response and great response to treatment uh, with uh, trametinib. Only a small portion, a proportion of the patient with logridioma were receiving this. But what's interesting is Girish presented also the cost benefit from the family standpoint when they have to uh, stay close to the hospital to, uh, to uh, the cost of accommodation because they live far away when they get chemotherapy. And instead, when they have trametinib, they have a normal life, they can go back home, they can have the treatment at home, they connect with the clinician through the cell phone. So things change considerably for the patient and the family. And there is another paper that is coming soon from Jordan, from Nisrina Marari, that um, is um, uh, uh, describing a series of 20 patients treated with uh, targeted treatment. Uh, again, access from uh, Novartis, a compassionate program, and we need to find some alternative to the compassionate program from the drug company to access this medication. But the message from this too is you can give targeted treatment in low and middle income country. This is no more toxic. This is feasible, this is safe. And only the cost is an issue and we need to figure out how can we can address the cost. A few things that I want to comment on uh, conclusion, the resistance to MEC and PRAF inhibitor is still a challenge. There are a lot of work going on and there is an ongoing trial based on the work that was done in Denver on hydroxychloroquine, which is uh, working on uh, autophagy and in combination with trametinib, sorry for the spelling mistake, or trametinib and dabrafenib. So this trial is going on and we 
show whether the addition of hydroxychloroquine can reverse the resistance to pyrophormic inhibitor. And what is the future now of this? The future might be in combination with chemotherapy in order to maximize the impact and perhaps to accelerate the senescence of the tumor. So there are clinical trials going on with COG, with selumetinib, in Canada with tovolafenib and in Australia. Some clinical trial with uh, mTOR inhibitor, though there is a PNOP trial that is going on, but this combination is relatively toxic. As I mentioned, there is some work on senolytic agents and, for example, from the family of Venetoclax. And there, are, there is some work going on also with immunotherapy because the immune infiltration may explain resistance to target the treatment. So all this work is ongoing and may uh, change the way we treat pediatric lobrodioma in the future. But my hope is it's not only going to be a privilege of high-income country, but also something that will be accessible in low- and middle-income country, and that by 2030 or 40, we'll have access to this treatment all over the world. So I'll finish there, and I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And Elia, can you open my video as well? Yeah, OK. Thank you very much, Professor Eric Buffet. This was an, excel an excellent lecture and overview of the low gray, uh, gliomas and the targeted treatment. We have some questions now. Uh, Professor Gurses Shahin from Ankara is asking, is there a targeted therapy response rate difference between the hereditary and non-hereditary NF1 patients with glioma, or maybe maybe no. in the ones no. with NF1 and uh, in the ones, yeah. Yes, please. Yes. So now, thank you, thank you for this question. That's very, very interesting. But the alterations are similar. There has been no specific study that has correlated the response with the type of mutation. But the hereditary uh, character has not been identified as a, a predicting factor for response to a MEK inhibitor in your fibromatosis type 1. Thank you so much. We have about 200 participants uh, uh, from all over the world. Thank you so much to the participants also. So we have a, another question. How does uh, any studies looking at BRAF plus MEK inhibitors combined with a chemotherapy backbone? You have just said about the selumetinib, vimblastin, tovo, vimblastin, mTOR uh, also, but would you like to add anything else here? BRAF yeah, so plus chemotherapy. The Yes, yeah, the work that was done by Diana Nobe was any type of uh, BRAF inhibitor. So that this was Vermirafenib, Abrafenib, or the combination. So this was regarded, and there was no specific uh, identification that the combination was uh, different uh, from uh, a single agent in the activity. So it's still unclear and, and I didn't mention that, but whether the combination of dabrafenib and trametinib is absolutely necessary here, uh, still an unanswered question. But the comparison with the chemo uh, has been essentially done in these two studies, uh, the randomized study with uh, Christine Carbo and the combination of dabrafenib and trametinib and the paper from Liana Nobe. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, a question from Rachel Angom. Are there com compassionate drug programs through which centers in LMICs can reach this, these drugs? Have mentioned so, some, but yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I will put my, uh, I will put my email in the, in the chat. And uh, if you want to know more about the compassionate program, I need to contact Novartis, in fact, today to see what's going on to the compassionate program, because it seems that it has been discontinued in a number of countries. But there was, up to now, a very good compassionate program with Novartis that 
that you can access through a website. So if there is a, the compassionate program is still open, I will uh, I will communicate with you. Yeah, we have a lot of thanks to you uh, in our chat. And there is a, a, a many questions. Walid Saad Musa is asking, is there a difference? Uh, how do we differentiate the pseudo progression and the true progression that can be used when we use targeted therapy? So first, uh, it, it, at what time uh, is there, uh, do, you, do you identify this? There are some, and it has been described with tovorafenib, there are some patients who continue to progress after you start treatment. And so, and uh, this has been described in the Nature paper that was published uh, in September last year. And some patients continue treatment and eventually decrease in size. So there is nothing that can say that this is progression or pseudo progression. It means that you shouldn't stop treatment too early. That's very important. You should give a second chance. You should wait for the next scan unless the patient has worrisome symptoms. But really, that's important to take into account. The response to target treatment is never uh, the, the same as a patient with leukemia when you give steroids. It can take time. This is a slow-growing tumor. This is a slow-shrinking tumor. And when you discontinue treatment, there is a, a, a risk of rebound. And the question is, how do you differentiate rebound and progression? I invite you to, to read uh, the recent paper on in neuro-oncology on this topic, rebound and pseudo-progression. But the message is, it's not clear-cut. And you have to be very, very cautious when you discontinue treatment particularly be rough inhibitor, because you, you may see some rebound, you may see some early progression. It's still the, 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 the clinical experience and not really, there are no specific radiological data that can tell you this. Thank you. There are some uh, questions. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Sorry, please, please. I, I will I, I will answer the question for Tezer. Hi, Tezer. Yes. So, <laughs> I was telling, yeah, Tezar is asking these three questions, and some people are asking the same question, yeah. Yeah, CDK in two A's, it's a long story, but CDK in two A is a bad marker. So it's a, a marker that seems to say that the tumor is getting ugly. You can see this in plexiform when they get CDK into a loss. You can see this in no glioma when they get CDK into a loss. It means that something is happening and the tumor is becoming aggressive. Now, and, and this tumor are more likely to transform into high grade one when there is CDK into a loss. Now, what we have seen in the clinical trial is the uh, patient treated with BRAF inhibitor who have BRAF mutation plus CDK into a deletion have the same response. And we are following this patient because we want to know if the fact they are treated with BRAF inhibitor, may change the course of the disease. They may not transform. It's too early to say, but it seems that something may happen. And these patients, so far, no patient where the CDK in 2A deletion in the clinical trial of a BRAF inhibitor has shown transformation. So it may change the natural history of this disease. But this is too early to make a very clear conclusion with this. And one question, uh, Professor Tezek, thank you for joining also, Tezek, good look. Uh, one question that he has asked, other people have asked also about the duration of treatment. You have said that when we discontinue, uh, it is a problem that, they, that we can have a relapse or rebound. And in the last slide, in one of the last slides, you have shown to use it for 36 weeks in one of the trials that was ongoing. But what is what is your recommendation? How long shall we use the rubberfenipramatinib? So, so I, I would, in any case, treat for two years, and then if after two years you want to discontinue the treatment, so this can be done relatively easily with a tumor that has a BRAF fusion. 
this has to be done very carefully for a patient who has a BRAF mutation. And this is where there has a recommendation from the Canadian group, the paper I showed with um, from uh, Greg Ecker and Sebastian Perrault, with recommendation to decrease very, very slowly the uh, dose of the medication, not to stop the cold turkey. And that's the most important. If you do it, do it very, very gently, and it gives you the opportunity, if you see that there is some progression to increase the dose back to the previous level. Dr. Buffet, in that slide, you had shown the tapering uh, by 25% for the triamatinib uh, every three months, for the BRAF inhibitor every six months. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so at least uh, just to um, tell our participants once again, and they can also look at that. Uh, you, In fact, this is being recorded and Dr. Buffet uh, consents to have it re in the SIOP YouTube channel. So we will have the video on the YouTube channel for the ones that want to uh, listen to it again, because there's such um, a wealth of knowledge here. And another question from Ekrem Unal, from Kai Seri, Professor Ekrem Unal is saying, I wondered what is your experience? Uh, sorry, it just went off here. Uh, with the Kai uh, H3K, but, uh, but uh, that is, sorry, I'm just trying. I'll just. So uh, yeah. is it uh, imipridone? H3K27 on... positive, sorry. But... Yeah, is imipridone on 201 or? <laughs> so this is a different story. If, if you want to talk, about ONC201, there is a paper that is coming soon in Journal of Clinical Oncology about ONC201. So you have to wait a, a week or so, a paper from different people, including myself, that is commenting on ONC201. But uh, nobody has the experience uh, of uh, the management of uh, log radioma with the H3K27 mutation. In fact, we have discovered this patient essentially retrospectively. If tomorrow you tell me this patient has a low grade glioma and has a H3K27 mutation, I will scratch my head and say, should I treat this patient like a high grade glioma or should I wait and see? Because some of these patients have been observed for years and, and, and they progress. I remember a child who was diagnosed at the age of three with a squint Eventually at six at the biopsy, and this was a ganglioglioma, we gave chemotherapy. And at the age of 13, developed a full blown DIPG. And we look back at the sample from the biopsy and it had H3K27 mutation. Would, have, would we have changed the treatment retrospectively? This child passed away when he was 15. He lived 12 years after he was initially identified as a patient with a tumor, a small localized tumor in the brainstem. So there is still a lot to learn, and we don't know if the uh, treatment with uh, uh, any of the drugs that have shown possible activity in uh, HK27 and mutated tumor can prevent the progression to a higher grade. Dr. Ridola from Athens is asking in the BRAF V600 E mutated patients to use either MEK inhibitors alone or BRAF plus MEK inhibitors alone together. So uh, <clears throat> we, we had a paper in the JCO that was in 2023 that uh, had uh, was part of the journey to the development of uh, the uh, protocol that was eventually is a randomized study. And part one was uh, the use of trametinib in BRAF mutated patients. And part two was the combination of trametinib and dabrafinib. So a MEC inhibitor first, and then MEC plus BRAF inhibitor. And in terms of efficacy, there was clear evidence that the combination was better than the MEK inhibitor only. So I would say, yes, a BRAF inhibitor or a BRAF plus a MEK inhibitor is certainly better than a MEK inhibitor. 
And in terms of side effects, the side effects were also much more pronounced with the MEK inhibitor only compared to the MEK plus BRAF inhibitor. So I would say, yes, use BRAF plus MEK or use BRAF, but not the MEK only. Both Rahat Ul Ain uh, and also Maria Jose uh, is asking about the dermatologic side effects, whether they wait in time or do they go the same all throughout the treatment? Uh, any suggestion in that? And is it, shall we discontinue because of these dermatological side effects? So first, it's very important to have uh, a prevention so that you work closely with the dermatologist, that you have protocol in place. There are a number of papers. There was a recent paper from Darren Hargrave on the, the skin toxicity in your oncology practice. Uh, we are working on a consensus paper on the skin toxicity, but really the message is uh, start very early to use topical cream. Uh, see the patient after one week to identify a skin reaction because it may be also something that require additional treatment, including antibiotics. So very, very important. If you have this under control, you don't need to stop. If you see that this is worsening, at least you should decrease the dose. And if this is too severe, you need to stop temporarily for one week or for two weeks. There are a lot of questions. It is a very interesting topic. And the one question that is Dildar Bahar Genç, Professor Dildar Bahar Genç from Istanbul is asking, uh, do you have a provision or experience regarding long-term side effects of targeted therapies, particularly on the CNS, given that these pathways are also involved in the neural development, like the learning, memory, et cetera, in young children. So now that's very, very important. So there are some early studies, in particular one from Laura Johnson that has looked at the neurocognitive profile and evolution of patients on trametinib and showing that there is no deterioration, but they are very short-term uh, studies but all the ongoing studies, the COG trial and the LOGIC trial have not only quality of life, but also neurocognitive assessment because we, we want to know and we need to know uh, what is the impact. One impact that has also been identified is with tovarafenib on the growth of the patient. There was initially some concern that 10 to 20% of the patient had some decrease in growth velocity there was a recent report at the ISPNO 2024 meeting that showed that when they discontinue treatment, there is a rebound, there is a catch up, they, they recover the growth delay. But the problem is when the patient is on treatment forever because he has a BRAF mutation, what's going to happen? And that's a $1 million question. Yeah. And uh, another question that was like, the question was whether to use only MEC or the two together. And uh, the uh, one more question, to use only BRAF inhibitor in, uh, in, and not uh, the two together. I think the answer is the same for both, maybe, we, yeah. Yeah, so there has never been any uh, comparison or head-to-head -head comparison or randomized study of the combination with a uh, BRAF inhibitor only in BRAF mutated patients. And um, I'm not sure that is ever going to happen because the FDA approval is as it is, it's a combination. But if uh, cost is an issue, uh, I think you can use uh, the BRAF inhibitor. Uh, the combination could be used only in that context if the patient is showing progression, or sometimes if the patient is showing two significant side effects, for example, parexia, and you can have some uh, or skin toxicity, you can decrease the side effect. And we observe that the side effect of the combination of dabrafenib and trametinib were less than the side effect identified with trametinib or with dabrafenib only. So this is better to read. Yeah, that answers the Dr. Enrico's question also. And I, Dr. Ayasha's question, you had told to use two two years. Uh, that was the duration also. 
for the immunotherapy, you had said you had a slide uh, from Amelia Richter. She was asking for the immunotherapy. You had a slide on the immunotherapy at the end, but I don't know if you want to uh, talk anything more about it for brain tumors. Will you suggest for low grade immunotherapy for low grade gliomas? So, um, again, I, I, I invite you, there will be a, 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 a book, the a book of the year from Child Nervous System. I think we, uh, most of the paper will be open access. There is a paper by Jan Polak, who is doing a lot of work on immunotherapy in low-grade glioma. Now, there is an increasing interest in immunotherapy because it may explain why we have differences in the response to target treatments when the alteration is the same in the different tumors. And so it seems that there is a microenvironment that is responsible for this. So this was initially an hypothesis, and now people are more actively working on this. Uh, uh, the team in Heidelberg, Tim Milder, for example, is uh, extremely passionate about immunotherapy for low grade glioma. And I anticipate that in the coming year, we will see an increasing growth of immunotherapy. Now, whether it's going to be immune checkpoint inhibitor or other type of immunotherapy, I, I don't have the crystal ball here to answer. There has been so many questions that we are almost 16 minutes over the time. There are some questions on plexiform neurofibromas, but today we are talking on low-grade gliomas. Maybe we'll have another session on plexiform <laughs> neurofibromas and neurofibromatosis, and also on uh, tuberous sclerosis. Uh, so uh, uh, I think uh, Dr. Buffet should also, uh, we don't want to take much of his time. We are really, really thankful to you for this very, very excellent lecture. And as you can see, people, there are so many participants, many questions, uh, many active uh, participants, as I say. And we thank also our participants uh, for actively being involved and for their questions. We may not have had time to answer all of them, but most of them have been answered by Dr. Buffet. We want to thank the Istanbul University Oncology Institute for the seminar series. We want to thank SIOP for endorsing these uh, seminars and also for uh, today for having this platform, the SIOP platform for the recording. And we will have this on SIOP YouTube channel for uh, re the video will be placed there so that you can uh, see the recording again and again, because we have to listen to it two or three more times. There are a lot of questions. And maybe we can have one more session on this topic, uh, Dr. Buffet. It is really a very uh, important session and one that uh, is uh, that many people are interested in. And so, uh, of course, I want to thank the participants as well. And as uh, this is SIOP endorsed, we want to say we have SIOP in uh, Honolulu in 2024 in October. We want to see as much as uh, as much of members as we can and uh, members and non-members. And also, of course, there will be a virtual uh, meeting where we'll, there will be a record. The recordings will can be seen afterwards. We want to see you there. Today, we want to thank again Dr. Eric Buffet, past president of SIOP, UICC board member uh, from the mm -hmm. University of Toronto, and a friend to all of us in low middle income countries and in the world, and a friend to all pediatric oncologists. He has he helps everyone that needs a help in neuro oncology. Thank you so much, Dr. Buffet. And your Thank last you. words to, you. the, yeah, to the audience. We, you want to, uh, any, anything that you want to say to our audience? No, no, it was a great session. Thank you for all your questions. Do not hesitate to contact me if you have any questions. Thank you, Suzanne, for um, uh, being in the background. Uh, I can see your smile and I, I look forward to seeing you all in Honolulu if you are coming or uh, anywhere in the world uh, when I travel. Thank you again so much. Yeah, we thank the SIOP Secretariat also. Anelia Tadasova was with us and Suzanne Volnak uh, has helped us. Thank you so much to them as well. So uh, see you in the next seminar. Thank you.